How's lockdown treated you? <laughs> lockdown has treated me and my wife uh, and my children and my grandchildren uh, okay. Um, I mean, as well as it has treated anyone. Right. Um, uh, we came down, uh, well, it's a long story, but we are all safe. We are all well. At the moment, we are not seeing our grandchildren because they started school. Right, and right. So we're now thinking about in under what conditions and circumstances we might be able to continue visiting them. Before that, they were very well, really quarantined. Right. Yeah, it's, it, and uh, you're teaching online uh, right now, is that yeah, right? Indeed, yes, yes. Is this a first for you or have you been doing it for a while? I, well, in the spring, I was teaching a graduate seminar when the pandemic hit and everything was moved to uh, online. So I taught the end of my seminar remotely, but that was a graduate seminar with only a handful of people in it. And now I'm right. teaching a classroom of un 40 undergraduates. Um, and as it happens, I am teaching with uh, online software. So it is a highly online course. Right. And I'm still, and there are still hiccups with, uh, uh, Zoom is very complicated and uh, <laughs> has all kinds of hidden tricks and traps. Right. Yes, sharing screens, sharing the right screen. Uh, exactly. Yep. Yeah. Opening I, I, Yeah. Oh, wow. I haven't even thought to attempt things like that. I've just been using Zoom for talking to my family, which actually I've been doing a lot more than I have in the past few decades. Uh, Correct. Correct. I have seen more of my brothers and ne nephews uh, than ever before. <laughs> and I suppose it's a good thing. I mean, uh, seeing them remotely. Yes. OK, well, uh, more directly relevant to you. Um, in the article that I'm going to ask you a lot about, which is Love as a Moral Emotion, yes. you describe an example of a childhood exposure to an air of paradox, which for some of us eventually condenses into philosophy. Was this oh, your correct. entry into philosophy? That's a very good question. Um, I'm the middle of three boys. Um, I, I believe we got on very well. Uh, and, <laughs> Although you haven't uh, we, seen them much until recently. Well, that, that's because they live uh, at a distance. Uh, we are actually quite close. And all three of us became academics. My younger brother, a logician, uh, who was very philosophically inclined, and my older brother, a statistician, um, I believe that I started doing philosophy as a child in a way. I have a vivid memory of a excited conversation with my younger brother, uh, who was the one who was closer to me in age, in which we more or less developed the theory of secondary properties, secondary qualities, um, given what we knew about color perception. And, um, and so uh, I, now, whether the fact that I started doing philosophy with one of my brothers as a child uh, is due to the conundrum I describe in the paper, I don't know. Right. Um, I certainly... Um, 
I do know that my parents went, so my younger brother is only 21 months younger than me, which uh, means that he was born at a time when I was still a toddler. And I know that my parents went to great lengths to make sure that I did not feel cheated of their attention. Uh, but to be honest, yeah, I, I couldn't say. So uh, did you uh, bring in uh, Locke's example of the three po uh, pools of water, you know, the, the warm water and the cold? I, I don't remember the details of the conversation. We were very young. We were still uh, sharing a room. Uh, so my older brother had not gone off to college yet. So, yeah, we were pretty young at the time. Because I, I remember room in which the conversation took place. It, it is um, odd that one can be drawn to philosophy at such a young age, but then you have to wait until college to get a chance to study it, really. That is correct. Um, I did get a chance to study it in high school because I had an English teacher who was extremely influential in my life. Um, who had been educated at Jesuit schools. Ah. And so uh, he, had us, he had us reading Plato. He had us uh, reading Aristotle's Poetics. And he taught us logic. And ever since, in fact, the course I'm currently teaching online is a logic course. Um, I... I believe that logic sh should be a required part of the high school curriculum. Uh, there is no, I mean, it, it's an extremely valuable thing to learn, and college is too late. And yeah, I, you, I, you, I, it is interesting. I, I, I teach uh, uh, logic both to undergraduates and uh, by, as part of an extension program to high schoolers, and uh, unlike other philosophy courses, it's the course w that can be done the same way to all of them. And, and they, because there is, I think, no point in doing political philosophy <laughs> with high schoolers. Exactly. But exactly. logic, basically you're discovering who has a logical brain rather than giving them information. Well, no, you're also giving them conceptual tools that that are useful uh, and so I, I developed over the years a uh, a web-based logic course um i had a look at that uh, i was just looking at that which I, I have taught to high school students and in fact underprivileged high school students in new york city uh with great success i, I believe um they seem to really like it uh so I might have to steal it. Although our high schoolers tend to be more privileged because it's the uh, it's the fancy high schools that want their kids to get uh, college credit. Sure. Um, but the advantage of that is they have good internet access. <laughs> yes. Um, I see that your PhD advisor at Princeton was David Lewis. Um, what was your PhD on and uh, how was he as an advisor? Well, David was the most wonderful advisor. Um, and I, I was, I look back on my graduate education and just marvel at how lucky I was. I was at Princeton in the day of David Lewis and Saul Kripke and Richard Rorty and Margaret Wilson. Um, and, um, to give you an idea of what a wonderful advisor David was, when you gave David a piece of writing, and of course in that day you handed it to him because it was on paper, um, he immediately took out his pocket calendar and said, okay, when will we meet to discuss this? So he already committed himself to a day by which he would be ready to discuss it. Foolish man. And <laughs> well, but it made him just, uh, 
And David, as people who ever saw him in action know, uh, he was an incredibly incisive critic. Um, and, and so uh, his criticism was, uh, yeah, extremely sharp. Now, David, I don't know how long you want me to go on about this, but David, <laughs> as, uh, as people who saw him in action know, David um, reveled in having a good objection. And at a talk, he would, you know, have an object objection, have a counterexample, and could not conceal his glee <laughs> at, at how clever it was. And so you couldn't be David's advisee if you had a um, a fragile ego. Right. But, uh, but I did not because I had previously did, done greats at the second two years of the classics degree at Oxford. And that more or less battered whatever ego I had going in. And so I, I was ready to believe you know, there's a, there's so much I don't know, right. and uh, his criticism just didn't bother me. Now, my thesis was on, I mean, my first book, Practical Reflection, was a rewriting of my dissertation, and so it was not in David's field. There's a story behind why I ended up working with him on this project, which wasn't in his field. Um, it wasn't as far from his field as you might think. It was David who told me that I needed to read Iris Murdoch, uh, which people would not have expected unless they knew that he did tutorials with I Iris Murdoch at Oxford. Ah. But in any case, that's, that, that was my experience. Oh, wonderful. Did you get to see the train set? I did. Legendary. It, it, it was, it was impressive. Yeah. Uh, so someday ask Michael Smith uh, his story about David's train set. And, okay. I'll... And show, uh, about David showing his train set to one of Michael's young children. Oh, that must have been wonderful. Yes. Um, yeah, I, um, uh, David Lewis's stuff is not really in my field, but uh, I had to take over a metaphysics class when um, my colleague retired suddenly. Yes. And uh, I came to believe that uh, all metaphysics basically ended with David Lewis. You know, he, he, he got it right. He got a tremendous amount right, and he wrote beautifully. Yes. Um, yeah, that's true. Literally, accessibly, um, and it's, it's one of my, uh, one of the things I mourn about the discipline is that the kind of prose that was written, not just by Lewis, but by Bernard Williams, by, uh, Tom Nagel in those days, by many others, uh, y y you can't find that writing anymore. No, I mean, I, I, I uh, used to love reading Quine, even though I didn't understand yeah. it very much just because he was a brilliant exactly. stylist exactly exactly yes so um the, the jury Harry, won't accept kind of writing anymore yeah that, that, i there seems to be um styles of article writing do go through phases and i'm not sure i mean i, I really noticed this when we had a post that we were advertising for so i got to read people's articles and it was like everybody's doing the same thing and I don't like it <laughs> exactly exactly so um so Fra uh, Harry Frankfurt was not at Princeton at the time no he was at Yale okay because uh so, so I did not know Harry that would have been useful uh, because one of the the books that you encourage in this uh, in this recent book of yours, one of yes. the books that you encourage the people to read is, of course, this one. Yes, about which I have written a lot. 
Um, yes, I'm a, yeah, I'm a student of Harry Frankfurt, but not from my graduate days. Would you uh, describe yourself as a Kantian? When I teach ethics, the, the, the bread and butter ethics course that is satisfies the requirement for our undergraduate philosophy major, I teach it historically. So we read Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, we read Kant's Groundwork, we read Utilitarianism, and we read Hannah Arendt's Eichmann in Jerusalem. Do you read them in that order? Because a lot of people do them in the reverse order. I don't do them in reverse order. I do them Mill first, then Aristotle, then Kant. Okay. And that's because in teaching Mill, you find yourself introducing many, many concepts that are going to play a role uh, in the rest of the semester and introducing them in an especially clear way. So, Although Mill is tricky because partly because he's got those 19th century sentences I don't um, know but but also <laughs> because it's it's deceptively profound yes. uh, yes. he just sort of seems to go on and on and you don't realize the meat that is there that's that's right and it's deceptive it, it, it seems so simple and it is by no means simple. I agree. Yes, and the students all complain about the length of the sentences. And I just think, damn it, learn to read those sentences because they are wonderful. Um, so, uh, but th what I was going to say is, what I say to the students is, we are not trying to choose among these views. All of them have something to teach us. And morality in life borrows from all of them. There are situations in which the judgment called for is a judgment of fairness or whether someone is cheating. Uh, and for that, you need Kant. And sometimes the judgment that's called for is a judgment about whether something is a vicious thing to do, and for that you need Aristotle. And then sometimes the judgment is called for is a judgment about how to do the most good. And if you think that one of these theories is going to enable you to make all of those judgments, you are making a mistake. So I am not a Kantian in the sense of being a Kantian to the exclusion of being an Aristotelian or a utilitarian when I think it's called for. But I am a great fan of Kant's groundwork. Now, I, I don't know anything. I have read the critique of practical reason. I don't understand it. Um, the only reason I feel I understand the groundwork is that I have spent so much time over the course of 35 years of teaching it, trying to figure out what's going on so that I can explain it to undergraduates. And for that reason, I think I understand the groundwork. I don't think I understand the rest of Kant's of Kant's ethics. And what I read about it in the secondary literature, I don't always like. I always, I sometimes think, oh no, he shouldn't have said that. Um, he should have yeah. stuck with the groundwork. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you're definitely not a true believer then. Yes. Um, so uh, I say that sort of as, as a precursor uh, for the next question, which is how were you drawn to write about love? Because it seems to me that uh, you approached it from a Kantian direction. Certainly... Definitely. Uh, the way I was drawn to write about it is Harry Frankfurt wrote a paper. I can't remember the title. I I'm pretty sure it must be in the footnotes of my paper, Love and as a Moral Emotion, in which he talked about Kantian ethics as, and I think morality in general, as 
inimical to the, the spirit of love. He, he, he wrote as, uh, about there being a conflict between being moral and being loving. I can't remember whether it was only being moral in the Kantian sense or being moral, but it was in a way sort of in the spirit of Susan Wolfe's Moral Saints. Right. Uh, and I read that and I thought, Oh no, that's that's wrong, and that's how I came to write it. Um, it was a a response to that paper of Frankfurt's. Now, what was the first thing that popped into your mind that made you think that that's wrong? I mean, what was it that what was the phenomenon that you I, I, said? I can tell you, my mother was raised in the religion of Christian science. My grandparents, her parents, were still practicing Christian scientists um, throughout the time that I knew them. And, and they both lived until I was a college student and I was very close to them. Uh, my mother left Christian science when she was in college back in the 1940s. Um, and Christian science, when I visited my grandparents' Christian Science Church, which I did only once, there were two slogans on the um, up on the wall. One said, th 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 "There are two principal slogans of Christian Science. One is, God is infinite intelligence." The other is God is love. And the, the idea is those are compatible. Love and infinite intel infinite love and infinite intelligence are embodied in the same being. And so I I was raised by people who believe that, and so the way I now put it to myself is, there is a, an intimate connection between clarity of mind and purity of heart. You cannot have a pure heart unless you have a clear mind. And if you have a clear mind, you will have a clear, a pure heart. Yeah, um, my my follow up question was, uh, well, this you know the next question was put your discussion in context in context, and I mentioned three names, one of which is Harry Frankfurt, so you've already done yeah. that because he was yes. uh, your motivation, but also uh, Bernard Williams because of course the drowning wife comes up all the time, and also yeah. Iris Murdoch, whom you've already mentioned. Yes, well, I mentioned Murdoch in the paper. Um, I think I also mentioned Williams and the Drowning Wife. Um, yeah, you do. I, I, I think, so, I, I, so let's talk about Williams first. Um, I don't think Kant has any objection to saving your wife. <laughs> Good um, to know. I, I think that is perfectly universalizable. Um, and people who think that uh, the, the morality of the groundwork requires you to give, so some people say it requires you to give equal consideration to everyone. And the sense in which that is true is not that the husband standing on the burning deck should give equal consideration to all of the swimmers who are in the drink. That is not the sense. Um, it's just that you are supposed to consider whether this maxim could be, well, I think it could be common knowledge that the validity of this maxim could be common knowledge among all practical reasoners. Where all practical reasoners is an abstraction. 
um, it's the kingdom of ends. That is this abstract conclave of practical reasoners. Uh, it's Rawls' uh, you know, original position behind the veil of ignorance. And looking at the swimmers, you're, you're not supposed to imagine them behind the veil of ignorance. The parties behind the veil of ignorance are they're just abstract practical reasoners. Um, and so the people who say, no, no, you have to give, you know, saving your wife means you didn't give equal consideration to the other swimmers. That's a misinterpretation of Kant. Uh, but so, uh, Williams, is, Williams does say that the, the whole thing is about the one thought too many. So you, you don't think it even requires the extra thought? No, well, I don't think, I think that the phrase one thought too many should be retired because <laughs> it, is, it, all, it is all that anybody ever uses when talking about that case. Yes, I know. Um, how can, under what assumptions about the workings of the mind can there be too many thoughts? The assumptions <laughs> are the assumptions are thoughts are individuated as propositions and each thought takes a certain amount of time. And so to have this thought would be to be a laggard in going to your wife's aid because you would have taken time to think this. And the answer is thoughts don't take time. And you can have lots of things are going on in your mind at once. And you can see at a you can see at a glance that family loyalty. Well, first of all, you have already dealt with this issue in the past because you have loved ones and you have a family, at least uh, uh, insofar as you have a marriage. And you have already faced the issue of favoritism toward your family members. And you have realized already that favoritism towards your family members is universalizable. And so you don't have to stop and scratch your head and take time to think about this. You've already done the test of the categorical imperative on the relevant thought. So, I, I have no patience for people who say one thought too many. I retract that question. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm glad you asked it because I have been looking for an opportunity to say this in writing and I was, I have not, I have not found one yet. Or um, maybe I have, maybe I have said it in writing somewhere. I can't remember. You're getting to the point, getting to that point. Yes. Um, so, uh, M Aris Murdoch, um, what? Oh, Aris Murdoch. I, I, I should just preface this. Um, I'm editing a, a collection of articles on love, which is what drew me to ask you for an interview, yes. uh, because your name comes up all the time. Uh, but also, uh, a couple of people in particular are drawn to Iris Murdoch's work. And it seems like you see your to what extent do you see your view as sort of an outgrowth of or a, a clarification of or a, a development of, of a sort of Murdochian approach? Yes, uh, I, I, I do see it that way. Uh, I, I, I think that, you, you know, the things she says about love being a form of attention and really looking and um, and transcending the fog of uh, fantasies that often, of self-serving fantasies, I think she calls them, that prevent you from really seeing what, what, what exists. Um, I take that to be a form of the thought that love essentially involves clarity of mind. And so, um, and that is 
the underlying spirit out of which I wrote the paper. So yeah, I, I think of the paper as an outgrowth of Murdoch's, of what Murdoch says. Not everything she says in that paper, but that part of it. Now, one of the things that we, well, the thing that we're supposed to uh, be responding to on your view, I mean, I, I, I want you to, uh, I'm gonna ask you a series of questions about this. You're gonna be sick of it by the end. But no. uh, the thing that we're, um, we're see, really seeing is uh, a Kantian personhood. Um, yes. Now, uh, Kolodny had a nice line in his article that was written between your two articles, between um, Love as a Moral yes. Emotion and Beyond Price. Uh, he, as he pointed out, personal ads do not read, bear Kantian person seeks same. <laughs> um, so his point being that, uh, he, this was a kind of, I mean, it's time to say, obviously, that that's a caricature of your view, but it's a snarky way of putting the point that um, he, that he or critics of you do not think that what we're really responding to when we love someone is their Kantian personhood. Um, now, would you say that the love that you are talking about can therefore, therefore be talked about as one love amongst many to which there are uh, alternatives, or would you say it's the core of all of them? For example, uh, it's a common place to say that there's agape, agapeic love, uh, yes. which is the kind of love that the, the, uh, the Jesus commands uh, yes. others. And uh, there's sort of passionate love and that you're talking about agapeic love and that it hasn't necessarily got much in common with passionate love? Or do you think that you're capturing a sort of essence um, that that is the true nature of love and anything else is sort of an offshoot? Uh, I, I, I'm, I, I, I'm not sure I want to choose either of those. Um, OK. I, I, I think that. I believe I say in the first paper that I am not talking about romantic love. Right. Um, now, now, I do believe that when romantic love is true love, it has the kind of love I'm talking about as its core. What Part of what I say is that the kind of love I'm talking about makes you emotionally susceptible. It lowers your defenses against the other. And then a lot of the components of romantic love are given an opening to rush in. Um, attraction. Um, appreciation for a sense of humor, um, interest in the other's projects, and, and, and on and on. Um, yeah, appreciation of the other's beauty, um, physical beauty, um, appreciation of the sound of the other's voice, uh, wanting to be near the other, and so on. All of those things then are given an entry. Um, and um, now, you can have all of those things, even though you don't appreciate the personhood of the other. But I would say, you know, that's not just, as I put it, liking the way someone walks and the way someone talks. Um, that's not true love. So I think... That's quirk love, as you called it. Yes, it's quirk love. It's, On the way to becoming a, a fetish. Exactly. You're a kink shamer. That's what you are. I am. Yes. Uh, so, so I, I, I don't think uh, I agree with Kolodny that when you uh, when you post a personal ad, you're not just looking for someone whose personhood you will appreciate. You're looking for someone who, who having seen their personhood, you will come to also 
um, appreciate their beauty, the sound of their voice, take an interest in their projects, want to be with them, want to, and so on and so on and so on. But unless, I mean, you know, you go on your first date with this person and you think, wow, she's a looker. And, oh, she does this really interesting job. I'm really interested in that. And she knows lots of things that I want to know about. I can ask her questions. And that's it? And that's why you want a second date? That ain't love. Yeah, you say, um, I'm going to quote you here. The account of love offered by many philosophers seems to me less like an analysis of the emotion itself than an inventory of the desires and preferences that tend to arise in loving relationships of the most familiar kind. Exactly. So that's what happens to you when you disarm your defenses. That's now, right. what, uh, so there's uh, a puzzle that has obsessed people who write on love of late, which is the selectivity of love. That is, um, how is it that uh, uh, I can love just one person the obvious answer is I love one person for their particular features. But then the problem is substitutivity. I mean, then it seems like you would yes. love that person's clone and that we don't want to say that about love. So your yes. solution to this is to say that in some sense, we, we don't love uh, people for their particular features. The particular, uh, we don't love them for that. That's something that happens after yes. the love. Yes. Or perhaps those are the features that tipped you off to their personhood. Right. Um, I, did, you, I, I do uh, like, uh, I, I think uh, this you is know, your, I'm sorry, carry on. My experience is that there are some people who, uh, because of, because of the way they look, because of their faces, because of their voices and the way they talk, I find them as persons present in their faces. Uh, oh, yeah, that person is here before me. And then there are other people who, well, they look like humans to me, but somehow their faces and bodies and voices and mannerisms just don't, just they just, the person isn't present to me. And I assume that that's very different. What causes that, what provides that reaction to different people is very different for each person. It's something different. Um, and you can say that you love the person for those features. Um, and that's then a different sense of love for. Those are the features that first gave me the realization of their personhood. Right, and, and that I think is uh, one of your strong, very strong examples, the loving people for their flaws. Um, that, uh, so what we don't really mean is that we love their flaws and that's why we love them. Yes, right, exactly. So you and so, so what I say about the selectivity of love is well you just can't be vulnerable to that many people, um, uh, you know we we are we are uh, you know if we were angels with uh, infinite attention and infinite minds and so on and uh, yeah maybe we could love everybody but we're not capable of it. I a, certainly don't. I certainly don't think you can love only one person. Um, even I'll find out when we're done what my, what my wife thinks of what I'm about to say. Okay? I don't think that I am constitutionally incapable of loving someone else the way I love my wife. Um, I don't, I never have, I never will, but there's a lot that goes into that having to do with our relationship and the commitments involved in that relationship and, and, um, 
and so on. Um, so the, if, if there's someone who thinks that they're constitutional, I mean, there are cultures that engage in um, bigamy, that engage in, in multiple marriages. And, and I suspect that, ah, you know, the Arab men who have multiple wives, uh, they may, maybe they love two of them equally. I don't know. I don't yeah, think I, it's part of the human constitution that this is possible only with one person. There's a, a, an article I, I read when I, because I, I am, I was unfamiliar in the, on the literature on love until teaching a class on film, actually. And I wanted yes. to do a, a topic on, on love. And I asked, um, uh, asked someone I knew who, who wrote on it to recommend a couple of things. And one of them was an article about um, polygamy or polyamory, sorry. Polyamory, and, uh, yes. uh, she was defending the possibility of it. And I, I, I just didn't like the argument. I, I, I mean, I get it, but I think that there's, I, I, I agree with you that I don't see that there's uh, any kind of contradiction in the notion, but it seems to be something important about love that it be uh, exclusive. I, I agree with that. I agree with that. I think that, so, I don't regard the commitments of my marriage as restrictions, as burdens. I regard them as enrichments of the relationship. Um, and so I am very glad that I am in a relationship with those commitments and that I have always honored them. That is of great, great value to me. So, but that's not a point about the emotion of love. That's a point about the value of certain kinds of relationships. I, I, think, I think having a life partner to whom you are exclusively committed is one of the most valuable ways to live. But that's not about the human capacity for the emotion of love. Yeah, that's uh, something to chew on. Um, but I have, I have questions written down here, so I'm going to go through them. Uh, I, I, will just, I, I will just add, I know someone who is in a polyamorous relationship. I don't know. You know, I, I don't know um, about the emotional part of it. I do know, I don't want to live that like that. I'm glad I don't live like that. Um, I, I greatly value that for over 45 years, I have lived in a monogamous relationship and will live in it until I die. I value that. But well, as, as you say, the... as, yeah. you, as you say, um, uh, one of the things that you notice about uh, the the Williams drowning wife case is that it switches viewpoints, and it's from the viewpoint uh, of yes. the wife that yeah. <laughs> uh, of the beloved that they want to be loved uniquely. Yes. So, so maybe that that's what we're 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 responding to that. Uh, there's something about being loved that requires that one be the only one? Nah. Nah? No, that's because of the, that's because of the primal scene that I set in the paper. And that is my parents had three sons. And the love of a parent for a child, I mean, that's a very deep, very powerful, very important kind of love. And I think it's possible. And I think that the sibling rivalry that, enta that includes wanting to be loved 
singular, exclusively, in a way, by your parents, in a way that they don't love your siblings, that's a, that's a tragic, that's a really bad mistake. Um, and so, um, no, I, you know, I, again, it's the, it's the exclusive relationship that I value, not the exclusive emotion. Yeah, I think you, I mean, I think you're right. I'm thinking, uh, if my parents revealed to me that really they didn't love my sister and they've been faking it and the love was just for me, exactly. I would be, I would find that disturbing, more disturbing than comforting. Yes, exactly. Well, what about people who have two very long, very good marriages in their lives? Um, um, and let it be that they were widowed the first time. Um, so there wasn't conflict that led to a divorce. They were two perfectly happy marriages. Now, do you want to say that the second spouse should think, Oh, not only did he or she love, does she or she love me, but she loved this other person just as much. So it's, so the people who think that we want love to be exclusive, they have to think they want it to be exclusive at the time. <laughs> um, not just exclusive over the course of a life. Although uh, the, you should watch the remake of Rebecca that's coming out. <laughs> yeah, that's why. I never saw the original. Oh, because uh, the point is that uh, his new wife, uh, the, um, the, I've forgotten the name of the, the, uh, the lady's maid who hates yes. the new wife and, and keeps telling her he doesn't love you. He only, his love is still for Rebecca who has died. Right, but so if the maid had said instead, "Oh, I he he loves you, but he really loved her too," uh -huh. um, for the second wife, so it does sometimes happen, I think, in second marriages that the second spouse is jealous of the first spouse, and because. The widowed spouse still loves the first spouse as one loves a deceased person. I think actually, if you're going to be the second spouse, it's better to marry someone who's had a divorce than someone who's a widow or widower because you can't compete with someone who's dead because they're perfect. Uh, I think precisely the opposite. Oh. You want someone who was a sound enough person to have made a good choice the first time and to have made the first marriage work and who is still a loving person who still loves his deceased spouse as one loves a deceased parent. Um, and I, and, one should value that in one's spouse. But, when, and, but you also say that it's possible to love someone who you can't stand, the dark truth about uh, some divorces. Yes, that's true. That's true, yes. Um, uh, yes, you also talk about, and I think um, this is where uh, you need to be careful in today's cancel culture, um, yeah. where you talk about love between a student and a teacher. Now, you are careful in your article, but certainly um, uh, oh. this is a... Yeah. This I is understand. An idea. I, knew I, I knew I was taking a chance. Right, which is why you, you very carefully explained exactly the uh, extent to which you meant that. Yes. There are... Some of my former teachers, I, I, I think I love them. Um, and I don't, I don't know whether they love me, um, but uh, I, and, um, and I mean, it's very common for people to speak of their former teachers as beloved. Um, okay. Okay. And, 
and and I don't think it's the kind of a exaggeration, exaggerated use of the word as when we say, oh, yeah, I really love him. Oh, yeah, I really love her and so on. I mean, they, they really mean they have an emotional attachment to this person. But you also. Another thing that um, I think marks your writing that I'm familiar with uh, as different from a lot of contemporary analytic philosophy is that you will bring in people like Freud. Um, because I think uh, Freud, of course, is seen as not respectable uh, to a great extent nowadays. Um, in some sense, uh, I don't think he's seen as a philosopher, even though uh, we don't make those distinctions about writers that uh, of you know the past. Uh, yes. We talk about Montaigne, for example, as if he yes. styled himself a philosopher, whereas uh, Freud, in some sense, is not a philosopher because he. Um, but uh, you you um, bemoan Freud's influence on love, because I, the reason I thought of this, of course, is because I think what a lot of people would say about a student's love for their teacher is that it was some kind of displacement. Transference. Or, yeah. Transference, yeah. And you, you are very explicit that you think Freud's commentary on love has been unfortunate because and it's part of the cause of this idea that love is opposed to morality or love and morality are, are not yeah, sympathetic. Yeah, yeah. Right. Well, that is, yeah, but th th that part of that paper should not be taken to indicate that I think Freud is not respectable. I think- No, no, I, added... I, I didn't want to say that. I think, I think uh, the, the first part of what I said was that you, uh, are, you are quite open in seeing yes. Freud as a fountain of insightful ideas. Exactly. Yes. And I think he was a philosopher of mind and a psychologist. I think a tremendous amount of what he says has to be discarded. But, uh, but that's true of Aristotle core, and Kant. Exactly. A very important core of what he says is true and insightful and threatening. And, you know, it is now... Uh, Psych there are psychologists who study the unconscious now and who are very careful to say, this is not Freud's unconscious. I am, uh, there is unconscious mentation uh, and I'm studying unconscious mentation, but it is not Freud's unconscious mentation. And I just think, well, if Freud were a lot li live today, Freud's unconscious mentation would not be what he was talking about in the early 20th century because he continually changed his mind and learned new things. And so he, he would have, but you never would have been able to do the research you've done on unconscious mentation if there hadn't been Freud. You know, it's like saying, oh, I'm a geneticist, but this isn't Mendel's to the genetics. And nobody says that. Yeah, no, I agree. And um, oh, yeah, there's an example of yours in uh, I think it's in Beyond Price um, that uh, you use to illustrate the phenomenon of love, loving a dog, which of course seems counterintuitive yes. because your love is supposed to be a response to Kantian personhood, which dogs yes. do not have. I'm assuming. Uh, but you said, my feelings for my late poodle were a response to the experience of seeing someone there in his eyes. Yes, I think that dogs, part of the domestic, the evolutionary domestication of dogs, and I do believe that animal ethologists think this, part of the domestication of dogs was... Of the, sorry, of their adaptation, their evolutionary adaptation to domestication was the ability to simulate personhood in their eyes and in many of their behaviors. Uh, and that's why they are so 
easily welcomed into the human family uh, because they evolved to look like there's someone there. And that's why um, so many dog owners say, oh, my dog is a person. Um, I mean, that, that's what dog lovers say all the time. But you, for example, but you would not say, uh, well, what I wanted to ask was, you use that as an example, but I, do you say that you love your dog in the way that you love your children? Or was it a simulacrum? It was a simulacrum. So he fooled me. He <laughs> but fooled if he fooled me. you, didn't that mean that you genuinely loved him? I, I did. I, I, I did. Hey, uh, you know, when he died, I, I was a basket case. <laughs> you know, there are psychotherapists who now specialize in therapy for people who are mourning pets. And it sounds silly. No, I, I, no, only to someone who hasn't had pets. Excuse me? Only to someone who hasn't had pets. Exactly. And I would say in particular to someone who hasn't had a dog. I have had many cats, and I never felt this way about a cat. But I really did fall apart when my dog died. Um, I didn't need th I didn't need therapy, but uh, I, I, I I was a basket case. Yeah, well, I uh, I I was just thinking that some of the things you describe are indicative of your life in New York City, because I'm pretty sure in Flint, Michigan, there are not yet therapists for for uh, people mourning their their pets. In Ann Arbor, Michigan, there are, and That's I know one. Of course, of course, but Ann Arbor attempts to be a little New York in a sea of Michigan. Exactly. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, so I actually know one such therapist in Ann Arbor. Yes. Go ahead. <laughs> um, my my son is currently at uh, at uh, law school in Ann Arbor. I'll, I'll, uh, he has a he has a cat who uh, we gave to him when he was about three because he wouldn't fall asleep and he would just cling to this cat and she can't last much longer and so maybe he'll need the services of <laughs> yes. um i wonder whether he has taken a course with don herzog who is a great friend of mine i will um, i will recommend it i um i recommended elizabeth anderson of course uh, but i don't know she she might be off doing macarthur genius things at the moment Oh, I'm sure she's teaching. Good. At least some. Well, she's, she's dedicated yeah, we, to. We certainly need her to teach. Yes. Um. Now, what was I going to say? Oh, yes, I'm going to uh, bring up another critic of your view. I'm sorry yes. to keep doing this, uh, but a more recent article by Bagley, um, where I don't know if you're familiar with this. He gives his uh, his his version of love is like improvising. Uh, but he has a, a section talking about uh, your your view. Yeah. And uh, he says that uh, beloveds are incomparable, as you say, but only up to a point. And his example is drawn from Wuthering Heights. Kathy can't switch love from, Lin from Linton to Heathcliff. She literally can't. Uh, and it's because uh, Heathcliff is irreplaceable in his particularity. Um, do you take that as something that you can accommodate or as a genuine criticism of your view? Well, so, you know, I've read Wuthering Heights, but it was a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, me too. I have to reread it. Um, um, I didn't like it. No, I mean... Um, um, I don't know what that means. Of course, uh, I think that the objects of love are irreplaceable because they are, but, you know, that's all part of the story of ends in themselves. Yeah. That are not to be paired. And, um, 
so now if if what he means is he can't be replaced in her life he can't take the role of the other well that's that, that's probably true but i i don't see that as i don't know what it means to be replaced in the emotion to be replaced as the object of the emotion. Uh, that, I, I don't know what that means. So, um, where, I think, uh, where I think your idea seems most intuitive is, as, as we keep saying, love of one's children. Because uh, I think we say to our children, and I believe it to be true, that uh, we love each of them distinctively, but each of them identically. Yes. Um, yes. And that makes sense well, when you're talking. Yes and no. Um, each of them identically in the sense that we love each of them in a way that, that prevents us from even making that comparison. We, 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 love them identically singularly <laughs> in that we are loath to talk about, to think about. The, the, the emotion forbids that comparison, but it forbids that comparison for each of them. Here's a, here's a, 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 a question for you. Now, one of the things uh, that you critics hammer at you for is um, not really uh, accounting for why it is that some people evoke the response of love. Because as you say, uh, respect is required of us for everybody. Yes. Love is on the same sort of continuum. So uh, respect is the uh, required minimum and love is yes. the optional maximum. And, but yes. love seems to come upon us without us choosing it. And, and you say, uh, why don't we love everybody? Well, we, <laughs> I was reminded, do you know the, the Flight of the Concord? The, uh, it's, a, it's the rare um, comedy music group that are actually funny. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, but, uh, I know uh, of it. I don't. There's a, they have a song called "A Kiss Is Not a Contract," which is based. I mean, they they play uh, complete losers who nobody would love. Um, so yes. this is a sort of parody of it, them imagining that everybody loves them, and they say, yes. uh, "We, uh, you know, it, they're they're talking as if to all these groupies that are trying to." to, to uh, get with them and they say, you know, I, we can't go around loving everybody. We wouldn't get anything done, you know, yes. um, uh, which reminds me a little bit uh, of yours because you say that the vulnerability, uh, we can't be vulnerable to everybody. But suppose we keep having children. We're going to have to, we already love, uh, you know, first child. Then we have a new child and we have to be as emotionally vulnerable to them as we are to the first one, and suppose yes. we have 10 children. At yes. what point does our, do we run out of vulnerability to give? Uh, um, well, that's an empirical question to which I don't know the answer, and I'm sure it varies for different people. I do know someone who is one of 11 children. Um, she uh, does not thank her parents for that. <laughs> Um, in fact, um, at one stage in her philosophical career, she was an antinatalist. She went to the opposite direct, to the opposite extreme. She is no longer in that position, but she definitely believes that one should limit one's fertility um, before one reaches eleven children. And she has a very interesting, a very, in very interesting things to say about why that is so. Um, so, uh, yeah, I don't know whether you can really love all of 11 children. Do you think that it is because everybody who has children 
Yes. Well, that, this is a generalization, which is, of course, likely to be false, but I'm going to make it. Uh, yes. Everybody who has children says, uh, well, you don't understand what it is to have children until you have children, and then, bam, it hits you, you love your child. Now, by your account, it seems entirely possible that through some unfortunate state of affairs, your child does not provoke that response in you. Yes. So, so, um, there is the love that you feel for the newborn, and that is instinctual. Um, and it is a kind of, um, well, it is an extreme fondness. It's the smell of their head. Yeah, yeah, and attachment. So um, I'm very interested in the in the psychological phenomenon of attachment. And love and attachment often go together, although not always. Uh, you know, there are the people I love who to whom I'm not attached in the sense that separation from them is upsetting to me. Well, like you said, student and teacher it can be an arm's exactly. length loving relationship. Exactly. You know, I don't miss them when they're not around. Um, and uh, so, uh, and so what you feel I immediately for the newborn child is not yet the emotion I'm talking about. Um, I mean, you know, I, I have a toddler grandchild. He's one and a half. And, oh, I love him. I, I, you know, I say I love him. But I'm just head over heels fond and attached and, uh, and but frankly, he, he's not a person yet. Right. Um. Uh, he, you know, he, he can't talk. He, he, he <laughs> understands only a very few things that you say to him. The conversations no, no. just go nowhere. Exactly. And so, um, you know, but uh, my own children, well, I, event I eventually graduated from that emotional constellation to real interpersonal love. So you think uh, uh, you do not love your children in the sense that you're interested in um, until they become persons, distinct, their own distinctive person. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. So you uh, fall uh, in yeah. love with your children. Yes, I think that's right. I, I, I think that's right. Um, well, first of all, I think that my view commits me to that. <laughs> <laughs> and also, now that you say it, I am I am willing to sign on to it. Um, I think that you know, gradually, your child defines him or herself as a person, and there comes a point where, yeah, yes. And this, by the way, this has a lot to do. Uh, so for many, many, many years, I taught bioethics. And I was a professor of bioethics at NYU. Um, and um, I, I don't mind. Uh, you should uh, you should write one. No, I shouldn't. Huh. Sorry, I, is that yours? It's Singer. It's uh, Peter Singer. It's the yeah, textbook. Yeah, yeah. I because I'm currently teaching bioethics. The trouble see, about yeah. the trouble with bioethics is, is that you have to put out a new edition every year. Yes, I know. I mean, um, uh, this one, for example, has nothing about COVID-19, so that makes it instantly out of date. Well, I have to tell you, I taught a very philosophical bioethics that had very little real-world content. <laughs> <laughs> I, I taught bioethics that was mainly about the harm of death, um, the so-called gift of life, um, and things like that, which um, 
which I think you have to you, that you have to study before you start talking about Dr. Kevorkian. Now, I, I don't know, is the name Dr. Kevorkian familiar to you? Oh, of course. I'm in Michigan. Sir, you are in Michigan? Yes. Yes, I, I, I'm at the University of Flint, Michigan. Oh, 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 sorry. I, sorry, I, 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 I didn't pay attention to where you're a professor. Oh, no, no, that, that's fine. You didn't, you didn't have to, but yes. Uh, don't, but also, don't I, didn't know whether you were, I didn't know whether you were old enough. Oh, yeah, no, I, I'm definitely old enough. He was, he was, uh, it was probably while I was, Either in grad school or just uh, just emerged from grad school when uh, oh, all of see. all of that was going down. We're closer in age than I assumed. Um, yes, we. Well, well, you look you look uh, better on it than than I feel I look. I must say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, well, it, but I mean, my my students it, when I taught bioethics at, at at NYU, my students didn't know who Dr. Kevorkian was. Yeah, yeah, and I started teaching bioethics when Dr. Kevorkian was a thing. Right. Uh, in fact, I, I, his, his lawyer Jeffrey Figer came to, uh, came to, came to the U of M and 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 spoke, and I went to hear him speak, and he right. was a rock star. The oh, students still, all... Figer still is still is a big deal. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, I, but, but I my, my, my view was there's no point in talking about Dr. Kevorkian until you've thought a lot about death in the abstract. I the, uh, I gotta say though, uh, I uh, I find Epicurus the Epicurean position very attractive, and I'm not sure I want my students to be convinced of that when they're doing bioethics. Well, my view in do when I distinctly remember doing bioethics at Michigan, and I, I felt that when my students talked about things like assisted suicide and, and so on and euthanasia, they had no idea what they were talking about. They because death wasn't real to them. Um, they, you know, they were still at the age when the brain is not sufficiently developed to take proper precautions, when people still do crazy things, crazy dangerous things, because they feel immortal. Um, and they would spout off about this and that, and I would think, y y this is a mistake. Y you're too young to study this subject. You, you, you have to you have to come you have to study it once you've come to a point where death is real to you. Um, reading this, I got the impression that uh, yeah. these these questions were becoming more and more real to you. Uh, Absolutely. That, Absolutely. That um, I I I find myself almost obsessing on those kinds of issues that. I try to be interested in other interest, uh, other issues in philosophy, but personhood uh, and and death and autonomy are, are the issues that sort of suck you back with like the force of gravity. Exactly, personhood and autonomy have always been the issues that that organize my philosophical life. Uh, Death, not so much, although I did have a, um, a health problem at a fairly young age when uh, death did become real. Um, so but you, you made it past it, I see. I did indeed. <laughs> that, that's good. Um, uh, what was I going to say? Oh. Yes, well, because uh, I would actually, uh, I, I wish I was just starting the phone call and we were just talking about personhood and death because I, I have a lot of questions, yeah. but um, I can't hold you here all day. And uh, yes, yes, yes. here's another one of your books. Yeah. Um, would you like, it seems odd for someone so influenced by Kant 
yeah. to be talking about relativism. Would you like to say why it isn't? Well, what I say in that book on, on relativism is that um, morality is a feature of a way of life, of a shared way of life. And ways of life are not all on a par because some ways of life do better than others at the function that shared ways of life serve for us. Um, oh, but there are plenty of ties. It, it's quite likely that there are ties, that there are very different ways of life that are just as good as others, and that differ on moral questions. And finally, I also say in the chapter, in the paper, it, that book is not a book, it's a collection of papers, really. Um, in the paper called Sociality and Solitude, I argue that there are features of the structure of personhood that exert a kind of pressure in the development of shared ways of life in directions that we recognize as moral and that I think that Kant and Aristotle and Mill would recognize as moral. And it has to do with the, it has to do with the fact that a way of life has to be shared. It has to be shareable. Um, and therefore ways of life in order to do what it does, which is make living together with other people possible, um, given the difficulties of radical interpretation and the way practical reason works. Um, and so uh, there are these equilibria, abstract equilibria, which are shareable ways of life. And given certain fixed points in human nature, those shareable, equal, those shareable, those equilibria are limited in certain ways. And so the evolution of ways of life is, is ways of life tend to evolve in ways that we recognize as moral progress. Or they and don't survive. Mm -hmm. or, or they, they don't, don't survive. survive exactly or they or they they don't survive or features of them don't survive in the sense that they borrow from other ways of life that to which they look and say oh yeah wow like their life makes a whole lot more sense than ours um that's a that's a much more workable way to live um and i think well, you see that happening in the world today. You know, polygamy is polygamy is on the way out. Um, um, and the you know the treatment of the the traditional treatment of wi women in Islam is th th that's on the way out. Um, it's on the way out in Saudi Arabia at least. Uh, and why? Well, it's in now that's in part because of the of the shrinking of the world that they they've got to live with the rest of the world now they you know communities are not as small as they used to be so you have to live together with almost everyone in the world um, but there's a reason why they are adopting they are grad very gradually all too gradually evolving in our direction rather than we evolving in theirs. On, uh, at least on that axis, I mean, uh, we could certainly learn from culture, more hierarchical cultures about, uh, uh, about treatment of strangers in the desert. Or... 
Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Yes, and, and maybe we will. Uh, currently, uh, I don't think many cultures are learning anything of value from the U.S. Uh, we we have nothing to teach other countries. Well, we we, we do, but uh, in the same way. Yes, uh, not in the way you would want. Cautionary tale. We are a cautionary tale. Let's hope it doesn't get more cautionary in a couple of months. I'm scared to death. I know it's uh, it's getting to the point where you just want to shut down all uh, all news uh, feeds and I, I, I read the headlines. I don't read the articles anymore. I, I, can't I bear. You, you feel like the modern world is making me is is sucking the life out of me. It's making me yeah. anxious, making me sleepless. And I don't think that the pandemic, because actually, if anything, I think the pandemic was suited me. Because there were fewer yes. cars. Oh yes, I and I, I, I found it. Yes, I, I find it uh, very calming. Um, the, the future is completely unpredictable. The future, you can't plan for the future. You can't worry about many future things because there's no knowing what kind of world it's going to be when we come out of the pandemic. And so time has sort of has sort of contracted. And uh, I feel I'm living in the moment. And th I've always wanted to live in the moment. Um, well, I don't, know. I, I don't know that you should, given that uh, what you say about uh, Frankfurt's uh, uh, caring about certain things as giving structure to one's life. Yes, 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 yes. But it is pleasant. It is pleasant to live in the moment, at least in the moment that I've got here in the apartment I'm living in. Yeah. Um, yeah. I um, have you uh, ever looked into Korsakoff syndrome at all? Uh, you know, Clive Waring. Say it again. Clive Waring, I believe, was the name of the, the famous guy who 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 uh, lives whose memory doesn't extend more than about thirty seconds. Yeah. Uh, yes. Well. Yeah. You have to think about that if you do personal identity. So I've thought about it a little bit. Um, do you think that that would be a little too much living in the moment? Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's a that's a little bit too much because part of what because although I although I can't really think about the future, one of the things I can do in the moment is reflect on the past. And I have lived such a fortunate life, such an unbelievably fortunate life. I have been so lucky at every point that spending my time sitting around remembering my life is, is great. It's wonderful. I love it. And not having to worry about the future because I can't imagine what it's going to be like, that's nice too. <laughs> I can imagine, and I don't like what I'm imagining, but. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, yeah, yeah. OK, well, go. thank you. Um, yeah, I usually, I usually ask one more question, which is, how do you see the role of philosophy in the world? But to a certain extent, I think you've said something about that, in that uh, you believe it should be taught. But I do think that a lot of the things you do uh, are very much engaging with uh, with the world as sort of uh, attempting to reach out from academia to the to the world, uh, like your this book in particular, and the fact that you make all your work available, uh, yes. even pirated copies. Yes. So I should tell you that uh, with uh, uh, someone named David Johnston Johnson, who is a uh, a lapsed philosopher who went into journalism after philosophy. Um, I am starting a magazine, which is going to be a magazine of public philosophy in a different sense from the sense in which that phrase is understood. It, it is going to be a magazine that aims to publish articles like the ones I was talking about that you can't publish anymore. Like, what is it like to be a bat? 
and um, and some of Frankfurt's papers, Frankfurt's uh, freedom of the will and the, and the concept of a person, and some of Bernard Williams's paper. Although Bernard Williams, some people say he was a great writer. I don't really think so. No, um, no, I find I find Bernard Williams. Uh, I was talking to Susan Wolf about this. She loves reading, yeah. but she loves reading Henry James, and that's. <laughs> That I wouldn't wish that on my enemies. I mean, uh, oh, I love Henry James. He's such uh, well, a it's, it's, oh, no, sorry, sorry, no, 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 no. I, I hate Henry James. I love okay. William James. Oh, okay. Yeah, yes. yes. Henry James couldn't write. I always oh. say the, the, the writing talent went went to the philosopher, not the novelist. What was it, uh, Mark Twain said? Uh, a, a library with no books and books in it is still a good library because it contains no Henry James. <laughs> Did he really say that? I believe so. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> now there's someone who could write. But yes, I, I uh, when I was in graduate school, I I I Im uh, imagined setting up an agency where a philosopher could call you up, describe what they were trying to to write. And you would give them the perfect example for them to use. Uh, yes, because yes, yes, yes. every yes. philosophy paper needs the drowning wife or the Mary in the black and white room. And so few, yes, yes. So few of them have it. Yeah, so this magazine is going to publish uh, original, serious, substantive philosophy, not just op-ed uh, essays. Um, but written in a way that the intellectually curious reader can understand. Are you going to ban footnotes? Well, we're not going to ban them, but we're, we're certainly not going to like them. Uh, references to the philosophical literature will be of no interest, unless they're references to the kinds of things that you recommend to your non-philosopher friends. I mean, you know, when, when, when people ask me, oh, you know, so uh, I never studied philosophy. What do you think I should read? I tell them, well, read Tom Nagel's Mortal Questions. Um, uh, well, well, I must say, I, I, I agree with you. And, and that book is sort of the paradigm. Uh, it, it's funny, um, David Lewis, uh, I remember wrote somewhere that he wanted to be a philosopher like that, you know, someone who dabbled in this and dabbled in this. And he said, against my uh, wishes, I became well, a systematic I, I became philosopher. philosopher. Exactly. Yes, but he wrote things that you could recommend to that friend. Oh, I mean, like, on free will. Yeah, and his paper on time travel it, it is, it, it, it is a great read. Um, and, and so it, we, we want to publish that kind of thing. So footnotes referring to that, uh, the kinds of things that I recommended at the at the end of On Being Me, those are fine. But recommendations to read things that are impenetrable, no, to, to the non-philosopher. 